with you First Timothy chapter 1. Uh, the song you just sang was written by a man named John Newton, and probably many of you are familiar with his story. Uh, John Newton was uh, the captain of a slave ship, and God saved him. And he wrote Amazing Grace, which he is most famous for, a song to express his heart that God could save him. Um, what's least known is that he wrote a book, more than one actually. It's called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, where he shares the testimony of how God saved him. Now, Grace abounding to the chief of sinners. I just want you to see if you notice where he got his title as I read the text. So I invite you, if you would, to stand. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. The formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray now that that would be the end of this message, that, that you would be glorified. Help us now to clearly reflect on salvation that is in Christ. Help us to clearly reflect on your grace and mercy. And Lord, we plead that your mercy would be embraced by those in the room who have yet rejected it to this point in their life. And that we all together would be able to say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Early in my Christian life, I noticed that when people would share their testimony, the worse you were, the better it was. Notice that? We wanted to get the really bad people up to tell their story. <laughs> uh, I think you need to be careful with that, even if you were really bad. Um, you're not the hero of the story. And regardless of how bad you were or what you did in your life, you should not tell the story in such a way that you become the focus. Paul was a really bad man. But when he tells his story, the focus of his story is always Jesus Christ. You see him repeat this multiple times throughout the New Testament. But here, a very short and succinct explanation of, if you will, Paul's testimony that focuses on Christ. And here's what you see, that Jesus Christ came with overflowing grace and mercy to save sinners. Now let's make sure we keep our context. Paul, in writing to this young pastor, Timothy, who is pastoring in Ephesus, tells him that he needs to deal with the false teachers who have arisen within the church at Ephesus who are misusing the law. They're preaching or teaching that the law is a means of salvation. And he turns in verses three to seven to teach the right use of the law, that the law reveals our sin and the law reveals our need for the gospel. Now Paul is going to use himself as an illustration of God's grace and mercy. And it's important. Paul was a false teacher. Paul was teaching 
that the law was a means to salvation. He opposed the church of Jesus Christ because they taught the opposite of what he taught. Yet, he is saved by the grace of God. So the first thing I want us to see as we consider this text is that no one is beyond the reach of Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank him. This is a a testimony of thanksgiving. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. And he's pausing your head right here. What he is first identifying is the deity of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is God. He is Christ Jesus our Lord. Because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. So what is it that he is thankful for? What is it that he has received? What has been given to him? Strength, judged faithful, appointing me to his service. Strength in that he has been given something that is not within himself, something that he needed in order to serve the Lord, that he had been judged faithful. Now you gotta be careful with that phrase because it almost looks like Paul is measuring up on some level and that's why God uses him. Then he says, appointing me to his service. So how did he get in the service of Jesus Christ? Because he raised his hand and said, I'll do it. No, he's appointed. God chooses him for that purpose. John Stott writes of this phrase, particularly a part judged faithful. This cannot mean that Christ trusted Paul because he perceived him to be inerrantly trustworthy. His fitness or faithfulness was due rather to the inner strength that God had given him. Now, Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Just while you're turning there, give you something sidebar here. When you see something in the text that just kind of like, how does that fit with the rest of it? You look to the rest of the Bible. You'll find your answer. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul did not see himself as inherently good. He said to me, this is Christ said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul is the picture of, of weakness and God by his grace perfects his power in Paul that's true in all of our lives through his weakness through our weakness and go back to to first Timothy that God would use Paul is amazing but here's what's more amazing that God would save Paul Verse 13, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I had received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now, before I, before I move into this explanation of, of Paul in a little more clear fashion, here's what I'm afraid of for some of you. I'm afraid of you that you, you've been around the church your whole life and Paul is a hero figure, if you will, in the New Testament. So you only see Paul as this guy who was the lead missionary of the church and this church planner who, who, who took the gospel. And you lose sight of who Paul was prior to his conversion. And I think almost in your life, and part of the reason I'm saying this is because I think this is how I saw things for a while. I think there was a period of my life when I would read this verse and I would treat this verse, verse 13, like hyperbole. Now this is real. I was a blasphemer. He's just not using a big word here. He, he's making a confession. I was a blasphemer. Now the word means 
to irreverently speak or act against God. And here specifically, against the Lord Jesus Christ. To irreverently speak or act. So, so, so here's why Paul is a blasphemer. He is alive when Christ comes. He knows full well what has been shared and said about what Christ has done, what Christ has accomplished, what Christ did. He knows full well that the church has emerged. And his primary opposition against the church is Christ. There was a significant period of this man's life when he said, Jesus is not God, Jesus is not the Savior. And to say opposite of that is blasphemy. He would have called a Christian a blasphemer. And as a result of that, he was a persecutor. His blasphemous character was matched by a commitment to bring physical force against those who he perceived were violating God's commands, that they were violating God's will. Now, holding your place there, let's go back to Acts. Go back to your left, Romans. You get to Romans, you're just about to Acts. Go to chapter 26 and look at verse 9. This is one of Paul's testimony points. This is where he's before Agrippa. He says, verse 9, notice this is quotations, Paul speaking directly. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So it was not just enough to try to rid Jerusalem of Christians. This man was so passionate that he was going to foreign cities outside of his own nation, trying to get rid of Christians wherever he could find a synagogue. Now, I hope you catch that in the middle. This man sat on juries where he cast the vote of death for blasphemers, for people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ he sentenced them. He was a part of sentencing these people to death. This is a semi sidebar here. Now, do you understand why you read the book of Acts that the early Christians didn't really want to be around Paul? Hey, Paul's coming to your church to preach. You'd be like, well, no. <laughs> Let's just not have him here. There was a period of time. To say, is this real? I'm, I'm, I'm back in 1 Timothy. There's one more descriptor he gives, and I think it's important that you see this. He says, I was an insolent opponent. The word insolent in the, in the Hebrew is where we get the word hubris. It's, a, it's not just arrogant. It's a swag, confident. In my head, think MMA fighter. Somebody who just exudes absolute, you know. You know, I'm thinking, you know, that, now the one fighter, he does his arms like this. Just somebody who just is completely full of himself. That's Paul. That's what he's saying. He was so self-confident in what he was doing. And humanly speaking, brothers and sisters, there, there was no hope for someone this aggressive but he was not beyond the mercy of God because it says in the text, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. God has mercy on someone who in their unbelief, not just someone, he has mercy on people who in their unbelief act ignorantly. He was trapped in his unbelief. This is absolute delusional unbelief. Paul actually thought that he was serving God. He 
thought he was doing God a favor. He thought he was doing the right thing to oppose Jesus Christ and to get rid of the church. So you've got to ask this question then. Why in the world would God have mercy on Paul? Jesus answered the question in Luke 5. Because I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now we get to the very heart of the text. That Jesus Christ came with overflowing grace and mercy to save sinners. I'm going to define our terms here. I don't want to assume that everybody in the room knows what I mean or what the Bible means when it uses the word grace and the word mercy. They're similar but distinct. The word grace means undeserved blessing, unearned favor, that God's blessing, God's favor is given to someone. Now, let's just be honest. Most people look at it this way, that the reason I got God's favor, the reason God has blessed me is because I've done something good or I am good. Grace says, no, you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. God and his own being from his own love extends what people do not deserve. Mercy is undeserved pardon. It is a person who deserves judgment. And that pardon is given to this person who deserves judgment. Every person who has become a Christian has received mercy because we all deserve the judgment of God. So in verse 14, he says, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. His grace is given in that we do not deserve it and it is given in an over flowing manner, super abounding. That's John Newton's title, grace abounding, super abounding, overflowing for me. And look at this sentence with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So what is the source of faith and love? It's Christ. So faith, my, the source of my trust in Christ is Christ himself. Love, my love for God and love for others, that source is Christ himself. This is good news. This is good news to any person who's ever said, God could not save me. I've hated God, I've turned against God, I've fought God at every point in my life. If you think that you are beyond the mercy of God, hear this, God took the chief prosecutor of the church, saved him, and made him the chief missionary. Only God. This saying, is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. And he's gonna make that statement multiple times in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. All the Bible is trustworthy and full of acceptance. This is one of those moments when the Bible's putting it bold, italic, capitalized for us, okay? Get this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And this sentence requires some meditation that Christ Jesus came into the world that is speaking to the incarnation, that God became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus Christ came fully God and fully man, not part God, part man, fully God and fully man. Now this is essential. Unless he's fully God and fully man, he cannot do what he came to do. He came into the world to do what? Save sinners. He does so in the work on the cross. Because fully God and fully man, he lived a sinless life. He kept the law perfectly on our behalf. He then was 
the perfect sacrifice who went to the cross and bore the wrath of God, took the punishment that we deserved upon himself. He took on the penalty of our unrighteousness. Now here's the great exchange that happens. His righteousness for our unrighteousness. Now we receive what we do not deserve. Romans chapter five. For by the one man's disobedience, this is a reference to Adam, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. There it is again, the superabounding grace of God. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading us to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only thing that leads us to true salvation. There's false salvation going on all over the place in the world. The only thing that leads us to true salvation is the grace of God abounding toward us in Christ. That Jesus came to save sinners. To understand that's me, that I I need his grace. And he says, to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Again, I come back. Paul's not speaking in hyperbole here. I mean, my goodness, think think of, again, what this man has done. Opposing the church, killing Christians. The lead persecutor, if you will. But here's what I think. I think any person who is trusting Christ for the finished work of Jesus on the cross, when they truly see themselves as in need of a savior, agree with Paul's statement and say, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. I know what's in my head. Thank God you don't. And thank God I don't know what's in your head. But God does. God knows what you would have done given the opportunity. God knows what you wanted to do. He knows. He knows who you are. Here's here's something you don't need to miss. To save sinners of whom, what's the next two words? I am. He didn't say I was. I am. I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. That in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul is saying his salvation says that no one is beyond the reach of Jesus Christ the Lord. The Son of Man, Luke 19, 10, came to seek and to save the lost. There's a quote. Jesus did not come simply to make you savable. There's an entire denomination, if you will, designed around that theological truth. It's error. Jesus did not come to make you savable. Jesus did not come to help you save yourself. Jesus came to save sinners. He came to save us actually 
and finally by his own actions on our behalf that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So which sinners are these that Christ came to save? The answer is all who believe the gospel and place their trust in Christ alone by faith alone. In Romans chapter 10, verse 11, the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. In other words, one religion or one ethnicity does not have a hand up on the other. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches. This not, has nothing to do with money. This is his grace. Bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he said, what does that mean to call on the name of the Lord? It means to say, I cannot save myself. I cannot help myself. I am going down. I am about to face the wrath of a holy God. I am a sinner and I need a savior and there is only one. That's what it means to call on the name of Jesus. You are saying there is no other way, none. There is no other way under heaven by which a man can be saved, a woman can be saved. It is Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. So I say to you, if you have never called on him, call to him today. Call to him to save you today. And if you have, hear me, hear me, because this is kind of the way Christianity is presented in this part of the world. Salvation is not an end to itself. Not. God didn't save you just to save you. God saved you for a purpose. And that purpose comes bubbling up here at the very end of the text. And it leads me to the so what? That trusting in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ elicits thanksgiving and praise. Paul knew what he was about to say, so he started this, I thank him. This overwhelming gratitude he expresses this short, brief, power-packed testimony of the saving grace of God. And he ends in verse 17 with praise to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. No longer a blasphemer. No more. Here's what he says. He's the king of the ages. Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's not just Lord of my life. He's not just Lord in this moment. He's not just Lord for a season. He is the king of the ages. He is immortal. Though he laid down his life on the cross, he is immortal. That means he rose from the grave and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is invisible. You say, well, wait a minute. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yes, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth, but ultimately he will not, he cannot be contained in time and space. He is the only God. That is, he is the God who saves. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all the redeemed, this will be true for all of eternity, but here's what Paul is saying to us, to all the redeemed, to him, be honor and glory forever and ever. Ultimately, Ultimately, my testimony of faith, your testimony of faith, even though it is to be used of God and can be used of God to lead to the sharing the gospel with someone who be saved, that's penultimate. That's not the final crescendo. The reason God has saved us, brothers and sisters, is to glorify him. And the reason he uses the testimony to save others is that they might glorify him. 
We're going to conclude the service in just a moment. I'm going to pray first by singing a hymn. It's a newer hymn. His mercy is more. I'm not trying to elicit emotion in you. But over and over this week, I've listened to this song in light of this text. And I've sat in my office and wept. There's two thoughts in my mind. That God would save me. You know what my other thought is? That God would save you. His mercy is more. It's new every morning. It never runs dry. And it is clearly seen in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I plead on behalf of the person in this room right now who showed up here hopeless and not knowing or trying to do the right thing and now they're confronted with doing something is not what you need to do. You need to believe. You need to trust Christ. I pray that they would do that now and immediately after the service that they would come and make that known to us so we could help and walk alongside them. Lord, I plead now for all your people, for your people in this room, that with humility, not thinking anything good about ourselves, with humility now, that we would come before you and confess that your mercy is more. Move among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.